Thanks for doing this. First off, really appreciate it. Congrats on all your recent success. That's got to feel pretty damn good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks for having me. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely felt good. Uh, it's been a good season so far, and I hope it continues this way. What's your biggest goal this year? Uh, I feel like it's been changing a little bit. I haven't known uh, like what I'll, I'll be scheduled for, but um, like th there were talks of going to Columbia instead of going to Pro Nats, but then we're doing Tour de Bos and Pro Nats now um, instead of Fall to Columbia. I wasn't even sure I was going to be rostered for any stage races coming into the year, but uh, a couple injuries and just some good results have had me rostered for those. So I've been excited for those opportunities. Um, you know, Pronats is a huge target. It, it, you know, I think that's the one kind of the same for everybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but definitely hoping for some good results uh at Tour de Bose. And you, you know, every time I line up, I'm looking for a good result. So yeah, that's sweet. So this is actually so I'll probably just start these podcasts just kind of start. This is a good start. And it's actually a question that for an athlete like yourself at the level that, that you're at, since you don't know every race that you're going to, and like you said, targets kind of change and the season sort of morphs. That happens to a lot of amateur athletes too. And it sort of can throw them off. They're like, wait a minute, I was going for this and now I might have a better shot at this. And like, it's just the calendar changes and events pop up and events get canceled. How do you then prepare for that? Like, how do you take a step back in the beginning of the year and look at maybe the phases of your training? Or you do you say, okay, maybe I want to be ready early in the year or I'm usually better later? Like, how do you take that big picture so that this doesn't like, you're like, hey, you seem pretty cool and collected about it. It's a huge question. I realize that. But, like, how do you take the 30,000-foot overview of the upcoming season? Yeah. Um, you know, in years past, I've always been really good at the end of the season, um, but not so good early on. And for me personally this year, I was coming into a new team, and I, I really was going to have to fight for my opportunities uh, I'm not, not in school anymore. So that's really helped my like winter training, spring training. Um, so, I, but also I've just had a lot more focus on that training because I knew I was going to have to fight for my opportunities and I was going to have to, uh, be ready at any chance I got in, in order to take, you know, full advantage of those opportunities and maximize my, uh, results and opportunities for the rest of the year so mm -hmm. cool um yeah i guess like the big thing is just uh be prepared all, like pretty much always i mean you gotta structure your season a little bit you gotta you know use some periodization in your training but uh you know if if there's a couple weeks with some big events in april then you gotta be pretty much peaking in April and then maybe you take a taper after that and look at how you're feeling and maybe your maybe your build didn't go exactly as planned and so you still have some some room to keep building after that April block that's kind of how I feel right now um but you know I, everything is always kind of in flux and you just that that's something that's one of the biggest things that I think really successful athletes are good at dealing with Mm, I love that. That's awesome. So be ready, but be nimble. And just sometimes you got to make a change. What's going way more uh, to a granular question that has come up a, a lot more in the past year, but training by power, heart rate, RPE, or a mixture of all of them. And usually a lot of athletes have been asking like endurance questions. We get emails about this all the time. What should I write my endurance? I did it. So what do you train? How do you train? I like a mix of power and RPE. I think I I I I wear a heart rate monitor always, also or almost always. Um, you know, I like that data. I think that data is really good for just managing fatigue and stuff. But I don't think it's that good for uh, actually tracking your workout, just because of the heart rate lag and you know just fatigue, the effect that fatigue has on your heart rate. Mm -hmm. um, I think that using power as a metric is a lot better, but also um, your power isn't going to be the same every day. Like 
if you if you're doing a threshold workout at the start of a training block it's going to be a completely different workout than three weeks into a super hard block like your your power your threshold just isn't quite going to be as high uh probably at the end of the block sometimes it is sometimes it's like insane and i don't really know why that is but like <laughs> all of that is why perceived is really important and in a race scenario you got to go off of your perceived effort like mm. some days you're going to have great legs some days you're not and you got to be able to figure that out with your body so i think perceived is really important that's a huge gem for people to hear that you know don't get psyched out when you go to race and you're not feeling great because guess what there's 10 other people there that are also feeling the same way you just got to still go and rip it i mean and you might come out with a great result like sometimes the feelings are off but it's good for people to hear an athlete at your level talk about that because everybody i think we get the idea that all oh, these guys are so dialed like all the time always on and just the more and more athletes that come on they're like no that's not the case so what's what when you look at you you probably ride a lot now that i'm assuming since you don't have school as well how do you balance volume and intensity and what is there one that's more important than the other or what's the sort of like seesaw there i, I think they're both super important um it definitely depends on like how much racing you're doing like when i'm racing a lot then my training is a lot more volume focused usually mm. uh and then when i'm not racing but i have a big block coming up then like it's pretty intensity focused just like sometimes it's four workouts a week like two wow. kind of vo2 two kind of uh sweet spot threshold um just to like you know the, there's with stage racing you're racing four or five days in a week mm. uh, with some of these crit calendars you're on 10 days in a row or something i mean <laughs> some, some of the, i guess i might have some 10 day stage races this year too so you gotta so be able to wild. handle that kind of intensity um and and so then you gotta hit that really hard but then also realize when it's time to back off after that block and recover from it what are some of your favorite intensity sessions? You mentioned some VO2 max. What do you have any particulars that you go to? Do you change it up a lot? Do you have just like one that you're always hitting? What do you What do you love? I change it up a little bit, but uh, I really like 2040s. Um, and I've been doing this one. It's a uh, 40 on, 20 off, 20 on, five minutes off. Uh, pretty much like maximal or like a controlled sprint, I guess. Um, okay. But I, I really love those workouts where you're just trying to do as, as much time at like basically max watts. Mm. That, those are those are my that's my peanut butter and jelly. That's my you know bread and butter. Uh, I love those ones. I love that. I, I know, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I I was just gonna say I know a lot of some some of the athletes I work with like hate those. They just like they'd way rather do a threshold day or just like go endurance ride or whatever. But those, like, those are my, I love doing those workouts. Yeah. I, I'm in that camp. I hate those. And it's probably something that I always tell people, like, if you hate it, I probably should do it more often. And I do find some benefit to it, but it's just like, God, it's so hard, but it's funny. It's people that love it. They love it. And like, you, I like that you said peanut butter and jelly. It sounds way more tasty than bread and butter, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a love hate thing. When you were jumping back to when you were talking, like, and then you said, hey, I might have like a threshold sweet spot session. If you're doing something at the end of the block, the threshold's not going to be as high. I know there's some coaches, and for people that know, Cade's also a coach. This is great having him speak as highly successful athlete and also a coach. There's some guys that say, well, if you can't really hit your threshold watts, you're not riding hard enough to do what we're trying to do. There's other people like, no, doing it fatigued is a good thing. Are you in the, since you said you're doing them when they're not great, you're kind of more in the, it's still okay, hit what you can on that day and like finish the workout yeah yeah definitely um it i guess sometimes it depends a little bit on where we're at with the training cycle and like if you if we're kind of early on and you should be fresh and you're just not hitting those numbers then maybe mm -hmm. something's wrong and so then it's better to not do that workout but in general yeah like i i like to give my athletes those workouts kind of when they're already loaded up and then it's just like hold on like push through it hold on like those those days i think are where a lot of the really big gains are made um and yeah i i don't know i like listen to fast talk labs sometimes and i really like uh 
some of some of their philosophies with training and one of their things was like uh the perceived or the the intention of the workout is sometimes more important than the actual power they're producing and like mm. if when when you are really fatigued and you're doing those threshold intervals and you're only at tempo watts or something like your legs are still loading up with lactate so you're still you're still actually over your lactate threshold because that that's like the definition of it is like if you're loading up with the lactate then you're over your threshold and so um i think that you're still getting pretty valuable training out of that awesome shifting sort of off the bike what do you think about in the gym is it worth it is it not worth it for you personally before you and then maybe if you can comment on your experience with other athletes that you work with who yes who no yeah i think it's definitely worth it uh sometimes it's tricky i i haven't been in the gym that much this year but last year i was in there a lot um and th it's really just i've been on the road a lot this year and it's mm -hmm. been really hard to figure out how to work it in and now i'm like in season and i don't think it's going to be that productive for me to try and jump into the gym mid-season i think i think that's a hard transition and i i'm definitely shying away from that for myself but i let me ask you a real quick question before i forget if you had been able to because there wasn't a lot of travel keep lifting up until now do you think you would keep it going or are you more saying like i'm in the season there's just not time anyway like forget the travel piece i'm just not gonna lift yeah i think if i had been doing it consistently then i would still be trying to do a little bit of maintenance like every like one lift every seven to ten days or so mm -hmm. and that's that's what i prescribe to my athletes who are kind of on that schedule um mm -hmm. and it seems to be working well for them it seems to line up with the science i've read so I, I and it's worked for me in the past so i think i think that's the way to go cool what do you think of uh are you more of a group ride or solo guy solo smash um, I'm a big solo guy. I, I I do love the group ride, but I always think that my best training is on my own. Do you think there's benefit for you? you see, someone like you, you go to a group ride, it, you got to go to a really good group ride or it's not really probably too challenging for you. Do you, What do you think for maybe the lower level cyclist, um, cat three, four, do you send them to group rides once a week once every other week what do you kind of how do you feel about those um yeah i definitely like the once a week for um kind of yeah cat three four kind of rider um i think just like getting pack skills is so 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 important mm -hmm. and a, a lot of times it's less about the workout than it is just yeah riding in a group and getting mm -hmm. those skills and I think some of my athletes go to different types of group rides kind of like some of them are like really like all out smash or like a really like, like race focused kind of effort mm -hmm. versus others are a little bit more just social. Mm -hmm. um, but both, both of those scenarios I think are good for building the pack skills. And then it's just managing the rest of the training around that group ride. So then you can get the, the proper intensity and the proper recovery. Yeah, that's awesome. Love that. So what this is kind of a, you were with a Volo, you had some probably pretty good mentors there, obviously some really smart and strong people on project echelon. What have you learned about cycling in the past three, four years that's made you better at cycling? That's a good question. Uh, I definitely like consistency is so big and that's something that I think I was missing before. And maybe it's not that I learned it recently, but it's really just been enforced by the people I'm around. Mm. Um, Do you think that was because of school? Like yeah. I mean, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it was mm. definitely around school. I, yeah. I, I just feel like I never had a lot of time in the schedule, but also I definitely was making decisions that, uh were making me less consistent on the bike mm, got it did you train so were you more of a cross guy before i was trying to look back at old results and stuff and i was trying i was trying to put 
we had raced when you were on matrix we raced against each other and i was like god how do i know this dude like obviously from the results i'm like i feel like i've raced against him a couple times and it was at like tulsa tough and i think at nationals i was like oh he was on matrix that makes sense but did you you raced a bunch of cross before you got into road or do i have that incorrect i i started with cross but i started like my first season was with cross and then i did road the next spring uh like as a junior and then i've been doing both of them uh like all the way through juniors and then through college and then i haven't raced cross since uh tacoma nationals what was that like 20 2019 i think um i'm actually planning out a cross season right now uh for this coming season so i'm pretty excited about that to get back to that uh but yeah i've been doing doing both for a long time cool do you have a do you like one versus the other I like them both. They're they're different animals a little bit, but uh, I I really do love cross a lot. But I'm really enjoying the road right now too. So yeah. awesome. Well, you've got Will Harden on your team, who the guy will do any bike race. So you at least know somebody's gonna be there for to go punish yourselves at these cross races because it's just so brutal. Yeah, yeah. I think Will and I kind of are similar with that. I'll, yeah, we'll just do any any racing is good racing that's literally what he says i'm like will you go to this race He's like dude i'll go to any race so, okay, that's awesome what's uh with now with social media we got strava a lot of pros are post everything is there anybody that you kind of have your eye on they're like man they have some interesting training like what is this guy or girl up to like i've noticing workouts do you get in that area or are you more just focused on what you're doing yeah i don't i don't really watch other people's training all that much um yeah, no, I, I'm not. I'm not the biggest like deep dive into other people's training. I, I I hear the chatter a lot of like, oh, this dude's doing some crazy like trainer TT power or whatever it is. But I I don't get into that that much. Okay, I think it's you're probably spending your time more wisely to other places, in my opinion. But I'm always curious. Uh, because some people do, they know like every wad and every workout and whatever. I'm like, man, how do you know? That's interesting. You know all that, but. Yeah. What is it that you, <clears throat> excuse me, that you think you want to improve the most on this year that is going to help you take advantage of these opportunities that you were talking about having that are coming up? Yeah, I've really been working on my sustained power, like 20 minute power stuff. Uh, I, my kick's pretty good right now, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. And just getting through those super brutal days and then getting to the finish line. I think that's that's what's going to take me kind of to the next level. So that's what I've really been focused on. What do you do to increase that? What's your method of, to that madness? Uh, mostly it's just adding volume really. Um, yeah, just like more hours is, is the biggest thing there. Definitely doing a lot of like threshold work also, but the biggest thing is just getting out and doing those endurance days, like not going that hard to, to compromise the intensity day, intensity days, but mm-hmm. just getting out and getting in time on the bike. That's interesting. So do you think that the increase in endurance volume will help you more than just the sporadic threshold work that you do? And do you do like constant power? Do you do over-unders? Do you do, and if you're trying to increase 20 minute power, do you go like longer than 20? Do you keep it at 20 shorter? Maybe just dive into that a little bit. I know people will be curious. Yeah, I, I, well, for the first part, I think that just doing volume is really important for me, at least the way that my physiology is. Um, like I do a lot of VO2 work and then getting kind of that, the slow twitch muscle, muscle fibers, getting that work in without compromising my sprint and vo2 work is really important and so the best way to do that is just those big endurance rides Mm -hmm. um and then yeah with threshold stuff i i have a lot harder like like we were talking about earlier i really like the like maximal effort kind of stuff (laughs) but i i definitely struggle more to just sustain power for a long time like i i don't like 20 or more minutes at threshold i i hate those kind of workouts and like i definitely push myself to do those more but a lot of my training is like 
breaking it into chunks. So I'll do like five or 10 minutes at threshold and then just like a one minute break and then mm. another five or 10 minutes at threshold. So then I get like a little bit of mental break and it's not really like that much physical recovery, but it allows me to make it through those workouts and push through. That's super cool to hear. There, It's been amazing. I want to say in the past 10 podcasts, three other athletes at your level have been talking. They don't really even go longer than 10 minutes in their high intensity intervals. They're like, it's just not what I do in a race and it's not how I ride. And, and similar to uh, James Piccoli was on, he was like, you know, just the constant power for me is like for 20 plus minutes. Like I never do that in a race. Like someone is gassing it and I got to go chase him down. And then I'm at like tempo and I get to chill for that one minute and then I got to gas it again. And he's like, so it's just been interesting to hear people, you know, it, was, it wasn't 10 years ago that everyone was like two by twenties. That's the thing. Like that's how you increase your threshold. And I love that there's just so many changes happening. And like, I get excited about this. I'm like, where, what are we going to be talking about in 10 years? It's going to be super, super interesting. Um, what do you think about in your day to day? And maybe especially even thinking about as myself being an amateur that does not travel at all. Like you guys, maybe the travel is a piece to this, but what's the number one thing in your daily routine that shows the biggest return to your success in the sport? I think uh, going back to consistency, it's just getting on the bike every day. Like, uh, well, not every day. Some, some days it's a good day to take a day off, but. Are you a uh, full day off guy or are you a recovery ride guy? Not to jump. I, I'm big on recovery rides. I think that occasionally like every, every other week or so a day off the bike but still getting out for some kind of active recovery is really important. I think mm. like, yeah, just take a walk around the neighborhood for 20 or 30 minutes. I think that's a great recovery day. Mm. Um, but also I think recovery rides are super important too. Cool. So what do you think is your best attribute in cycling? You've got the kick, but it sounds like you're working on other things. What right now has gotten you the success that you've recently found and like you said you're on this new team that's crushes what do you think has helped you get there uh kick kick has definitely been i think the biggest attribute uh but also like just positioning and and race mm. feel race awareness race tactics mm. uh and those kind of go hand in hand but it's being able to be in the right position and then being able to finish the job that's awesome What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, I've kind of built this philosophy, I think, from advice from others. But uh, it's just like, it doesn't matter how you feel. Just go get the work done. Go race the race. It, like, when it's when it's go time, the rest of everything else doesn't matter. Like, it's mm. just it's just go time. And so I, I think I've really worked to make that my mentality and just, I, I don't think about anything else when it's time to go. It like, it doesn't matter how the legs feel. It doesn't matter if I got sick last week. It doesn't matter if my sleep wasn't good. Like, it's just, it's time to go just do whatever I can do. And that's, that, and that's it. That's like, whatever I have on the day is whatever I have on the day, but I'm going to, I'm going to get out there and get after it. That's awesome. What do you do then if you're having one of those days, maybe it's that week when you're trying to get after it, but you just don't feel good. You're just like, I am not riding well. Like what do you, where, what do you look to towards or how do you kind of like diagnose that? Yeah, there's yeah, de definitely that can be a sign of overtraining or, um, you know, sometimes it's just like the other things in your life aren't really going your way or whatever. And so it's kind of dragging you down. Uh, usually I'm like, I don't know, I turn on some like punk or some heavy EDM or something. And I just like reset kind of my mind space and I get out there and get after it. Uh, maybe like have too, too many cups of coffee or something. <laughs> uh, and I just like kind of try and force myself to get after it um but there's definitely 
you got to be a little bit calculated with it because you got you, you've got to manage that overtraining. You, you've got to know when it's time to just pull the plug on a workout or on a training block mm. and just know that it's 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 too much. You're digging yourself into a big of a hole. Mm-hmm. So there's a balance there. But yeah, usually I just I try and get myself amped up somehow. Is the for when you're talking about like maybe doing too much training or digging a little bit of a hole is the biggest red flag there just feeling off and tired or are there other things that you notice about yourself where you're like, ooh, this is maybe I'm going too hard right now. I think a lot of people pull the plug too early, honestly. I think that they don't dig themselves into big enough of a hole because they they start feeling that, ooh, maybe I'm big digging too big of a hole. Um, so I think feeling's important, but also it's relative to the volume of work that you've been doing the last couple of weeks and, and the whole season really you have to look at, but the last couple of weeks is usually kind of the, the more important piece there. Um, so yeah, it's hard. You, you gotta be able to listen to your body, but also kind of be able to override it and just keep digging into a hole. And then, and then when the block's over, you really got to just take a whole week to just rest, chill out and, and recover out of that hole. That's like the flip side. That's really important. I like that. uh, Yeah. I mean, I think having a coach is really important for understanding when it's time to keep going hard and when it's time to, to be done with a block um last year i tried to self-coach and it was really uh, you know i thought i could do a good job because i was coaching other people and i felt like i was doing a good job with that and there's it's not even like the knowledge that you're getting from a coach that's always the most important but it's just having somebody kind of looking over your shoulder giving you a little bit of affirmation that you're doing the right thing um and just like yeah, a secondary opinion that yes, you're doing the right thing or no, you, you need to stop or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's the the second pair of eyes. And and like you said before, having someone that can so much clearer, see the big picture and be like, dude, it's time, trust me, it's time to pull the plug. You're not losing anything by not keep like finishing this block that's put out in training peaks. And I'm with you, man. I have tried to self coach it when I'm in my own workouts in the day to day, I struggle to see the big picture. And then it's like, am I, am I doing too many VO2 max workouts? And then like, I look back, I'm like, damn, like, why did I do those ones? Like, I'm just like, dude, somebody else should be telling me this. And it's, it's, I have had the exact same experience. Like, oh, I'm coaching people. I know what to do. It's just different. It's Owen shot has been on. He always says a surgeon wouldn't operate on themselves. And he's like, it's just too hard for me to to do like, do I go long? Do I go mega long? Am I going too long? And so, yeah, I like to hear that. Yeah. Uh, you brought up coffee, which made me start thinking about food and maybe we jump onto some nutrition things. What's your go-to for on the bike? And this is obviously a huge question, like maybe hit on long rides, but what are you actually doing for like a four hour road race? Um, mostly just bottles with like beta fuel Mm -hmm uh like 80 gram or 100 gram of carbs bottles is pretty much all i race on i i I bring gels with me because uh with the team we have a mix of different things that we're getting Mm -hmm. hand ups for and so i don't always get to choose uh the beta fuel bottles over like the standard mix bottle or the the water bottles so i always have gels with me um but i'm like I love the liquid carbs. I I hate having to chew during a race mm. uh, or really during a ride at all. I like gels and gels and hydration mix are pretty much all I use. So do you do that on like a long endurance ride also? Yeah. Sometimes I, I bring some solid food or I go buy some at a gas station or something just because of, I don't know, cost and ease, but uh, for the most part, yeah, I, I try to train with the same stuff that I'm racing with. What solids are you going to buy? I don't know, like Swedish fish or maybe a okay. bar or 
so it's not like a sandwich yeah. it's like still sugary and like easy to take down yeah 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 totally cool. so yeah i mean if it's like a really mega day then yeah i'll stop for a sandwich in the middle of the ride or something but usually usually i'm trying to keep going and just get the get the quick carbs yeah sweet what about off the bike how important is nutrition to you when you're not riding uh it's it's huge i think i think it's really important to to make sure that you're fueling enough i think a lot of riders don't don't eat enough um and i think that especially this year i've been really focused on that and i'm a a little bit heavier than I have been in seasons past, but I'm doing a lot more power. So I think that's been really important for me. That's awesome. Are you big into cycling tech? Like the gadgets, gizmos, you're on like team aero squad. So I don't know if that bleeds over into you or where do you land on that? Yeah, they're definitely converting me a little bit. <laughs> I, I, I'm i not enough of a nerd about it to do the research on my own really, but I know that a lot of the guys on this team, especially, are are doing that research. And when they're trying to tell me something, then I then my ears are open. Okay. So yeah, I I've started wearing Aero socks pretty much every race, uh, which I I definitely didn't do before. That's maybe the biggest conversion that they've had me make. But uh, yeah, I I mean, a big thing is just I don't. I'm not in a position where I can spend a lot of money on like all the gizmos and gadgets. So I don't spend a lot of time researching them because mm -hmm. it's just window shopping for me. Mm -hmm. um, what aero socks are you yeah. wearing? I'm just, I have some like Alibaba, uh, just, you know, the cheap, cheap, cheap. Do they stay up when you sweat? Cause I've tried uh, a couple and they like get droopy and I'm like, I don't know if this is really arrow anymore. And so I'm trying to find, maybe I need to be going to Alibaba. It's uh, it's the glue is important. You got to glue your socks up. Did not even know that was a thing. Okay. So there's Drake duels on the podcast a couple weeks ago. He's like arrow socks. He went off on this whole thing. So I had a pair that I guess rode for a team and then I'm like, Oh, whip these arrow socks out. And I also put them on for like a seven hour gravel ride. So it was like hour five. It was like a hot mess. So glue, what kind of glue are you using? Uh, I don't even know. That, it's like, you're like it's we, mastic from the uh, tubulars. <laughs> no, it's it's like a skin safe roll on adhesive. Well, we, yeah, I don't know. I just use the stuff that the other guys are using. Like, just give uh, it a yeah, yeah, yeah. It's we, there's one that's like a spray adhesive and one that's like a, a roll on. Okay. It's got like a little ball applicator thing. Oh um, my God. That's they so seem funny. to both work equally well. The I think the roll on's a little bit easier to and a little bit less messy to apply, but damn, yeah. I just threw the pair of socks out and I'm like, shoot. All right. <laughs> Learning something new every day. What do you think is underrated in cycling right now? Underrated. I think just, well, actually, I think it's coming around a lot. There's two things I think that are coming around a lot. One is the nutrition side of things, just like eating enough and well and like, you know, super high carb. But I think that's coming around. I, I still see some uh, like lingering effects of this kind of idea that it's like be as lean as possible all the time. Um, but I think that's, starting to get replaced a little bit um and then just these like I, i'm really big on just a massive block and then massive recovery for training um like not i i don't know i think it's more effective to like really dig yourself in a hole and then come out of it rather than kind of chip away slowly like week in week out at, at least for me for whatever reason, the second one's a lot more draining. It feels like, like when I'm able to just totally ruin myself, I, maybe it's the same thing with like those workouts, the maximal effort workouts. I just, I just like being able, just giving free reign to dig that deep and then just recover out of it. But mm -hmm. I think 
uh like sam gaze i know was like a guy who did that a lot uh and people i think like a couple years ago people were like what is this guy doing a little bit but now he's like really i think hitting his stride and becoming really successful and Mm. i think that that's kind of part of it what's the recovery week like for you go and smash and you're like okay i'm obliterated what are you doing for recovery those next five days seven days or yeah um it's like kind of alternating like on the bike and off the bike recovery but uh, i think being active a little bit every day is good get the get the blood flowing get your muscles activated a little bit um all of that's important to just keep facilitating that recovery and keep all keep your body like processing your carbs and keep your body like uh, just you know, mm-hmm. fueling through that and all of that is really important for your recovery. And then even the next week after that is like, for me, usually pretty low intensity, but st- uh, getting back to the volume. So like increasing the volume, maybe one or two intensity days, but uh, so it's kind of almost like a week and a half or two week rest period where it's oh, wow. like, okay. I mean, you're, you're still riding in that next week and and getting a lot of volume, but you're doing it at pretty low intensity, like just endurance zone. And then I think that is really that. Yeah. Do you have pushback from athletes on if they, do you have them do that? Because I know some guys it's like, if we're not slain on Tuesday after a rest week, they're like, what is going on? I'm like, dude, just go ride, go for a four hour ride. That's still pretty hard. Like I want to crush. I'm like, you don't need to do that right now. But do people do you get pushback if you have people do that, or is are they like they're just used to it by now with you? Absolutely, I, I get pushback. I, the guys that I've been coaching for a while, though, just yeah, they 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 they've bought into that, mm-hmm. so I think they see the value in that. Um, been getting a lot of good texts in the last couple of weeks, so just like man, I'm crushing right now. I, like, it seems like it's working. So you know, that's that's always good to hear, and it's validating to to that philosophy but yeah i definitely get pushed back from the guys when i first start working with them that's sick that's i like uh, this is gonna be there's always like a clip from something that i want to like send to certain athletes i'm like see listen to kate this is what he this is like a thing that people are doing um so this kind of also hits on since we talked about team arrow but more watts or more aerodynamics uh i'm i'm big on focus on where you have the most to gain so Mm. if you have big watts but you're sitting upright in the wind with your elbows out (laughs) then learning to get your elbows in and get the head down and all of that is is gonna be the biggest it's gonna have the biggest effect on your racing but also if you're spending all your money on aero stuff and you're not spending all that much time on the bike then like come on man get on <laughs> get out there and start pushing some watts um so yeah i th- i think it's a balance like sometimes you have an easy 15 watts to gain in a one month block of training and sometimes you have an easy 15 watts to gain by getting your head down a little bit or getting a better helmet or what you know whatever it is Mm -hmm. uh so yeah i just i think targeting the biggest gains is Mm -hmm. always i I like that yeah no that's smart what is your biggest inspiration to keep going forward there's got to be times maybe when there's just like you're traveling and the racing maybe the racing is going well some days and then not like is there something that's like pushing you like what it's a tough sport to be in what keeps you going it is super tough uh i've found a lot of just intrinsic motivation to figure out how far i can take this thing like i think i have a lot of really good tools at my disposal i feel like if i'm not doing everything i can to just maximize who I am as an athlete that I'm then I'll really regret it in 10 or 15 or 30 or 45 years like I only have these next couple years of my life where I'm at like my athletic prime 
or whatever. And I, I just, I want to see where I can get with that. And I think I'll always regret it if I don't, if I don't push that limit. Do you think so you're 25? Is it 25? Yeah. So do you think you only, what about like when you're 30? I mean, you might not be able to, maybe your cap of like when you can get as high is in the professional ranks, like Peter's out, but like, do you really think after that you won't be making gains that like you are in your prime prime now? Uh, I don't know. That was kind of an arbitrary number that. I okay. Out. I was just, I was, um, yeah. Yeah. I definitely the next few years are the biggest, like, yeah, the, they're the years where I can advance mm -hmm. in the, in the professional ranks. Mm -hmm. um, also, I just like, like at some point, see myself like settling down and having a family and stuff. And I, mm. I don't, don't know how feasible it is to manage my like personal life goals there with the, this, this sport. It's just, it's, the sport's super time demanding. Mm. Uh, and so, and so would some of those other goals. I hear you. Um, I so I, I think, yeah, just like, for me, it's like definitely the next five years are are kind of where I see myself uh, really pursuing this, and then uh, we'll see after that. But there's definitely some other things that might start interfering with that. Okay, cool. Appreciate you sharing that. What's uh, finish this sentence? I never dot dot dot. Uh, this goes back to something earlier. Just I never listen to the sensations uh or well okay i never let the sensations dictate the effort that i'm gonna put in let's put it that way i you know if if all the if everything is a go if all lights are green like with I, I don't think i'm pushing myself too far into some kind of overtraining hole then uh, all systems are go. I'm I'm on it. I'm like I'm giving it everything I have. So you're getting me hyped up because one of my friends was like, "You're kind of soft these days." I was like, "Wait, what?" He's like, "You don't. You're not as like you gotta go do this. Like you're kind of like, oh, you don't feel good. Like maybe you should rest." I'm like, "Wait, what? Am I saying that?" He's like, "Sometimes." And so now I'm like, "Damn, Cade, we're everybody's gonna get their." whip crack this week on training peak like get your ass out there listen to Cade Bigmore what are and I think maybe not your skills for success but for people that are listening they're like man this dude is winning big races right now he's 25 he's on a really awesome team and they're they're looking up to you what do you think are some skills that they should try to hone to get to that next level and maybe go even beyond? Yeah, I think uh, just just backing up your talk with your walk is is important. That's that's kind of a skill, I think. Uh, just knowing when to. I guess shut your mouth and put your head down and knowing when to uh, also the reverse back up your walk with your talk, knowing when to put yourself out there, because I think that's something that holds a lot. Both of those things I think hold riders back. Like so, some riders are a little bit too humble. Uh, I don't, but I don't even think it's like humility almost. It's, it's to the point where it's like that they're just too, quiet they're not putting themselves out there enough and then you just don't get opportunities if you're not you, you gotta you gotta be your own biggest hype man sometimes Squeaky wheel gets the grease but then at the same time no like nobody really wants to listen to you if you're just if you're just talking all the time so th there's a balance there uh and yeah finding that balance and for me i i try to be more on the just put my head down and and, and do the work uh, and, and let the results talk but I'm also learning to put myself out there a little bit more I like that so you have a good uh, a lot of these answers have like find, find the right balance of all these things with Cade it's like it's not just one or the other but it's yeah it's good um so you kind of was gonna ask you maybe what the biggest race is that but you kind of already hit on that would you say road nats and you know, you've been winning a lot of crits, so do you have a preference when you're talking road? Is it road race, crit, 
either one do they both mean the same to you uh, the the road race at pro nets is like that's the pinnacle for for my season that's like the biggest mm-hmm. race i see on the calendar right now um uh, obviously both the road race and the crit are targets uh and i think maybe i i, I probably have a better shot at the crit and i'd really like to to take that chance um but if I had to choose one or the other, it'd definitely be the road race. And like, I have had good results in crits, but I don't think I'm just a crit rider. Like, and I'm, I'm kind of on a mission to show that. Awesome. You've dropped a ton of gems. My last question for you is, you know, you talked about consistency. You've talked about different intervals you're doing. You've talked about putting your head down, do the work. Is there one thing that you would say to somebody who is a newer cyclist that is like the best piece of advice, maybe something somebody told you that you referenced before, or, um, and maybe it's something that you've already said, but what do you think is like when athletes look to you like, Hey man, what am I missing to do? Like, what do I got to do? Is there something that is just like the cave big more like motto for improvement? Take your easy days easy and make your hard days hard. And for me, endurance days are lumped in with easy days a little bit there. Uh, they're not exactly the same thing, but I'm a bigger proponent of longer, slower endurance days. And then just make sure that you're primed and ready for those really hard intensity days. Someone's going to email me to ask you, so what is the target on those longer, easier endurance days? Uh, yeah, it's just like getting the volume at an elevated heart rate, but not like super elevated. You, like you just want to be in that endurance zone. It doesn't have to be, uh, usually I'm telling my athletes not to push the high end of that zone, just push like the middle or like kind of middle bottom of that zone, get out there, get the volume in. And then I promise you, I'll make you hurt on these workout <laughs> days. I love it. Man, thank you so much for doing this. This is uh, very insightful for so many people, definitely to motivate people and give them a ton of knowledge to move their game forward. Do you have any closing words for the listeners? I think uh, where I left it's pretty good. Awesome. And what's the best way for people to get in touch with you for coaching, but also to follow along with the year? Are you more like a Twitter, Instagram, Facebook guy? What's the Where should they hit you up? Instagram. Instagram is probably the best. Okay. Uh, that's where I'm most active, but I'm on all, all three of those. Uh, yeah. And I'll Instagram put your, great. I'll put your info down here in the show notes guys. So hit Kate up. If you have questions, coaching, whatever, thank you for doing this. Thanks everybody for listening and we'll talk to you soon.